Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Jean Beeman of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I'm also a member of the CES Executive Committee and co-chair of CES's Race and Racism Research Network. I'm delighted to welcome you to our presidential panel for today, a decolonial project for Europe, sponsored by the Journal for Common, of Common Market Studies with our keynote speaker, Dr. Grima Brambra. With the toppling of statues of colonizers and growing anti-racist struggles in conversations about legacies of imperialism and colonialism, just decolonizing curricula, et cetera, across Europe, this is a crucial moment to consider questions of colonialism, post-colonialism, decoloniality, and racism. And I want to briefly note that the Council for European Studies has also been thinking through these questions. By broadening the idea of what European studies is and broadening our idea of who scholars of Europe are or can be, including bringing in global perspectives and voices that have been traditionally underrepresented. I am proud to be part of an organization that is thinking through these vital questions. I don't wanna take up too much time, so I will now turn this over to Richard Whitman and Tony Ostrup, who will introduce our lecture and speaker. And I wanna thank you again for being here, wherever here is. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. My name is Richard Whitman. I'm one of the co-editors of the Journal of Common Market Studies. We're absolutely delighted that uh, the Council of European Studies has been able to host this lecture the first time they've done so. And for us, uh, as uh, editors of the journal, uh, it is uh, an important way of signaling the scale and scope uh, of uh, work that we publish within the journal. If you feel that the journal is not for you, uh, or perhaps you are under some misapprehension as to what the journal focuses on, I'd encourage you to take a look at our uh, editorial note uh, when we took over the journal and published in, in 2018. It makes very clear that we are seeking uh, the widest possible breadth uh, of scholarship on Europe, uh, as well as scholarship on the European Union and that we are a journal which is very much focused uh, on multi uh, and interdisciplinarity. So uh, please uh, take a look at the journal, take a look at us, uh, and we'd be delighted if you would send us your work. But we're here this evening um, for, for what uh, for us as editors is an annual treat, which is that we get to choose uh, a scholar uh, whose work that we admire, who's a scholar whose work that we think is important, uh, and a scholar whose work uh, that we think uh, talks uh, to uh, the way that we want to think about Europe uh, and European studies. Uh, and so uh, I'm absolutely uh, delighted that Gaminda uh, has agreed uh, to deliver the lecture this year, only one year late, because of course we planned to do this last year, but obviously events uh, got in their way. So I'm going to hand over to, to Tony, uh, my co-editor uh, for the introduction. Uh, thanks very much, Richard, and I apologize in advance because I seem to um, have developed very sketchy internet. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Gaminda um, on our behalf to this platform, and thanks again to CES for giving us the platform to host this annual lecture. I'd like to introduce uh, Gaminda, and it's my great pleasure to do so. Um, professor Gaminda Bamra is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies in the Department of International Relations at the University of Sussex here in the UK. She's also a fellow of the British Academy since 2020, having previously been a professor of sociology at the University of Warwick. She's held visiting positions and guest positions at the universities in Sweden, France, the United States and Brazil, and is currently affiliated with uh, Remeso at uh, Linköping University in Sweden. She is the author of Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism and the Sociological Imagination from 2007, uh, which won the 20, 2008 um, Philip Abrams Memorial Prize for first book in sociology. Her more recent publications uh, include uh, Connected Sociologies from 2014, uh, which I should say is open access and the link is available via uh, Gaminda's website. And um, her, while her latest book, um, Colonialism and the Modern Social Theory was just published uh, actually a few 
months ago, barely, and it's co-authored with John Homewood. Uh, Gaminda, of course, is a prolific author and um, a collaborator as well, having co-edited five collections and um, organized many several special issues in a variety of sociology journals. Uh, Gominda's research interests are uh, primarily in the area of global historical sociology, but she's also uh, broadly interested in the intersection of uh, social sciences more generally, with her recent work focusing on post-colonial and decolonial studies. Um, she is also the series editor of the Theory for a Global Age series, uh, currently based at Manchester University Press. And she set up the Global Social Theory website to support students and academics interested in social theory. And I found it very useful um, for my own work as well. There's a lot of things that Gaminda is involved with. Um, and uh, But I think everyone is here to really listen to you speak. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thanks again for joining us today, Gaminda. So thanks so much for the introduction and also thank you for the invitation to both you, Tony and Richard, for to, pr to present this lecture today. It's a real honor to be invited and I very much appreciate the opportunity. I've worked for over a decade, I guess, on the idea of post-colonial Europe and have argued for the need for Europe to acknowledge its multicultural present as much as its off-stated commitment to ideas of cosmopolitanism as constituted by its imperial and colonial histories. And so in this talk, what I'm going to set out is to ask the question of what a decolonial project of Europe might look like. I'll begin with a recent episode that highlights the multifaceted and complex nature of what I wish to address. So in May 2021, the German government agreed to a gesture of reconciliation with the Namibian government in recognition of its brutalization and elimination of the Herero and Nama people in Southwest Africa in the early 20th century. This gesture, however, fell far short of the reparations being called for by the Namibian people and advocacy groups. Indeed, Germany explicitly refused to use the language of reparations and instead offered 1.1 billion euros over 30 years in aid and not compensation. This sum doesn't exceed what Germany already provides to Namibia in development aid, and Germany's framing of the issues, as set out by its foreign affairs minister Heiko Maas, has also been regarded as deeply problematic. Maas stated that, and I quote, we will now officially call these events what they are from today's perspective, a genocide. However, a former Namibian cabinet minister, Kazinambo Kazinambo, questioned what was meant by from today's perspective and asked, and I quote, what about yesteryear's perspective when the atrocities happened? The long-standing failure to acknowledge the events and the refusal now to use the language of reparations has meant that Germany's gesture of reconciliation has rung hollow for many Namibian people. Chiefs from the major royal houses, for example, have rejected the offer, as have activists such as Laidlo Peringanda, chairman of the Namibian Genocide Association. Peringanda further argued that the offer of development aid did not address the historic loss of lands suffered by the population or offer any support for the descendants of those who had had to go into exile after the events and now live in other countries. While Germany may believe that it is acting properly in seeking to draw a line under a difficult history, for many Namibians, that history is not simply in the past. It continues to shape the present in quite profound ways. As such, the drawing of any line would need first to recognize the problematic nature of the events as they happened, the ensuing refusal over a century of Germany to recognize the atrocities or take responsibility for them, as well as to address the contemporary concerns about the patterns of inequality established during colonial times. <clears throat> Most of the arable land in Namibia, for example, continues to be owned by Germans and by people of German and European descent. 
As Henning Melber argues, and I quote, the current distribution of privately owned land is a constant reminder that colonialism did not end with independence. In this way, colonial land disposition, which continues to structure inequalities within Namibia and between Namibia and Germany, also needs to be addressed in any project of reconciliation. This, however, seems to be beyond the purview of the current conversation as it is conceived by the German government. The failure of Germany to adequately reckon with the ways in which its colonial history has shaped it is not peculiar to Germany, but it's the common condition of all countries involved in the European colonial project. Reparations are frequently recognized for losses to property recognized within European juridical norms, whether that be confiscated property from Jewish people or property nationalized under former communist rule and earlier recognition of the need for compensation for the loss of property in enslaved people after abolition. However, the appropriation of lands under colonialism and the forced appropriation of human beings, their labor and resources are not accepted as in need for compensation. It is this disjunct between on the one hand, Europe regarding colonial history as the past and of little consequence to its understandings in the present, and on the other hand, formerly colonized countries and populations living with the ongoing legacies of that past as a present reality that motivates this presentation. In arguing for a decolonial project for Europe, I argue that this would be a project that acknowledges Europe's past as one largely constituted by its colonial activities and which seeks to rethink Europe and its contemporary relations to the rest of the world on that basis. As P.O. Hansen set out two decades ago, scholarship on the historical evolution of European identity tells a simple and encouraging local story. It is one of rivalries among European countries, the role of the United States in its post-war reconstruction, and the bipolar division of the world order embodied in the Cold War. Out of this, Europe has become an expression of peaceful integration and a demonstration of how a past of conflict and inequality can become, or at least that's the narrative. What is omitted, according to Hansen, is the dismantling of another world order, that which had been structured on European colonialism and imperialism. The failure to acknowledge decolonization across the 20th century occurs alongside the failure to acknowledge colonialism itself as central to the development of the modern world. As such, the first task of any decolonial project for Europe has to be to account for the colonial histories which have shaped it. As such, I argue for a shift in focus from Habermasian ideas of Europe exemplifying an unfinished project of modernity to following Nelson Maldonado Torres, an understanding of Europe's unfinished project of decolonization. Or in terms of the example with which I began, to shift from an understanding of development and aid, which are about one's own moral sensibility, to an understanding of reparations, which are about acknowledging historic wrongs and accounting for them. Where we start from and which histories and epistemologies we acknowledge when we do so profoundly shapes our understandings. In this talk as elsewhere, I seek to make the case for why history matters in the social sciences and why more specifically, understanding our colonial past is necessary for understanding who we are in terms of the pressing political issues that face us. Post-colonial approaches work backwards in terms of reconstructing historical representations, as well as forwards to the creation of future projects. As Michelle Rolf Trujillo argues, the silencing of colonial encounters is one aspect of a wider narrative of global domination a narrative that will persist as long as the history of the West is not retold in ways that bring forward the perspective of the world. While much post-colonial analysis is oriented to the Middle East and South Asia, and decolonial studies focus on South America, the Caribbean, and to a lesser extent, Africa, the one part of the world that is most in need of such analysis is Europe itself. 
Europe, I suggest, is in urgent need of decolonization, and this can only happen by taking its colonial history seriously and explicitly working through their contemporary manifestations. John Locke in the late 17th century wrote, in the beginning, all the world was America. That is, in their discovery of the Americas, Europeans believed that they were encountering earlier versions of themselves. This laid the groundwork for particular understandings of hierarchies among and between populations across the world. Understandings that came to be conceptualized within a stadial theory of social development. In effect, if the peoples encountered by early European travelers were understood as being their ancestors, then Europeans could both show them their predetermined future and be unconcerned about their elimination. The first encompasses a belief in development and progress. The second suggests that the disappearance of other cultures and peoples was not a brute consequence of European actions, but a quasi natural phenomenon integral to a civilization process. The peculiarity of colonialism and the end of empire is that the nations and populations that were responsible are not required to account for those wider histories in discussions of their past. As Said long noted, and I'm quoting here, on the one hand, we assume that the whole of history in colonial territories was a function of the imperial intervention. On the other, there is an equally obstinate assumption that colonial undertakings were a phenomenon marginal and perhaps even eccentric to the central activities of the great metropolitan centers. The misunderstanding central to such assumptions is that the state within Europe was a nation state, when in fact it was an imperial state. Standard genealogies of the state within Europe tend to see the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia as central to the emergence and consolidation of the idea of national sovereignty and the political equality of states. The key issue, however, is that over the subsequent centuries, European states did not simply exercise their sovereignty within the territorial boundaries of their national state. They also exerted power and violence over territories and populations elsewhere. So in this way, sovereignty was only to be respected in relation to other European powers and was not regarded as significant to encounters with peoples and lands beyond Europe. Indeed, as Anthony Angie argues, the doctrine of sovereignty was itself explicitly a statement of the relation among European powers, and it allowed the exercise of sovereignty over non-European others as an expression of that sovereignty. This explicitly legitimizes for Europeans the terms of an imperialism that would incorporate the non-European world into the ambit of European powers. So one of the issues at stake here is that core European states are understood as having a theoretical and conceptual integrity as nation states. And what happens beyond their national borders is not regarded as important to the approaches developed upon reflection of their ostensibly domestic activities. To understand them as imperial states, however, would be to bring within a common frame of analysis events and processes that are otherwise incorrectly disaggregated. It would be to recognize the colonial processes upon which subsequent developments depended, and indeed to understand the constitutive nature of colonialism to states within Europe and ultimately to Europe itself. Post-colonial Europe, as I've argued previously, is the Europe that disappears from view in the standard narratives that frame it in terms of understandings of cosmopolitanism. For European cosmopolitans, the European project is seen as the bringing together of nation states into a newly established transnational federation. Yet the majority of European states that constituted the European project in its early iterations were already transnational entities, that is, imperial states. While European colonialism was not the same across the continent, there were varieties of colonialism which overlapped and intersected over time to create a European colonial project. This project was carried out by states, for example, Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands, among others. It was carried out by trading companies in association with states, for example, the English East India Company, the Royal African Company, the East Dutch 
East India Company. These traverse the Atlantic as well as the Indian Ocean world. Colonialism was also a project of heads of states, such as Leopold, King of the Belgians, and of individuals and communities from populations across Europe. The latter were involved through what 19th century German advocates called emigrationist colonialism. That is, populations creating national enclaves within the settler colonial projects of other European nations. Throughout the 19th century, over 60 million Europeans left their countries of origin to make new lives and livelihoods for themselves on lands that had been inhabited by others. This included at least 7 million Germans, more than 2 million Polish people, 2 million subjects of the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary, over 8 million Irish people, nearly a million Swedes, and over 13 and a half million British people. Within the European landmass itself, there was the colonization of indigenous peoples in the Arctic Circle, the subjugation of Roma populations, and the hierarchies of oppression in terms of relations between more powerful countries and the minorities that lived within the lands they claimed or came to claim. A European colonial project was also, following the work of Pio Hansen and Stefan Jonsson, carried out by the project of European Union itself. Not only were Europe's African colonies unquestioningly put at the service of the incipient European project, but as they state, there was a stronger statement, and I quote, that Europe's unification could succeed only if it was also fashioned as a joint colonization of Africa. There is a failure within our standard historical accounts to acknowledge these long-standing colonial connections and the ways in which they were both organized along lines of domination and oppression and were hierarchically constructed. Such issues have come to be central to questions of legitimacy and the related fears of white replacement that are gaining traction in Europe today, not just on the right, but also from figures ostensibly associated with the left. The fundamental assumption in such accounts is that the national patrimony, that is the wealth available to the nation, that is available for distribution, is precisely that, national. That is, it is assumed to be wealth that has been generated through the activities of national citizens over time and whose use and distribution ought to be regulated for the people properly understood, whose contributions and efforts it represents. The failure to acknowledge the colonial histories that have made possible the wealth of European nations is precisely what enables and drives the current politics of resentment and division. The violence of imperial rule and colonial settlement disappears from histories of the nation, happening as it does outside of the borders of the national state, at the same time as arguments about national sovereignty are used to securitize borders in the present against others who are said to invade. It is this long-standing association between an understanding of one's own citizens and subjects and a sense of entitlement to land occupied by others, as well as claims that Europe itself is unable to sustain the presence of others, that aligns colonialism with 20th century fascism with contemporary European politics. What is needed to combat this is to use Prasenjit Dwara's resonant phrase, to rescue history from the nation. To illustrate this, I turn to Britain as a case study of some of the arguments I've been putting forward. The Brexit years, if I may call them that since they are continuing, are premised on a narrow understanding of who Britons are. This limited belonging or well, this under, you know, so the way in which Britain constructs its sense of itself limits belonging to those who can demonstrate a filial relationship to the history of the nation. One of the key slogans of those arguing for exit from the EU was, we want our country back. The we that was dominant within public debate on Brexit was a we that was believed to be historically constituted in national terms. And it was this history of being located within the nation that was seen to determine who should or should not have rights. 
The most visceral attacks came in relation to a sense of that national community having been betrayed by a metropolitan elite that, that appeared to care more for the situation of non-British others than it did for the legitimate citizens of Britain. Whilst I'm focusing on Britain here, I would say that this has also been a trope of many other European nations in the face of a migration crisis whose European origins have been effaced. As I'll go on to argue, in the broader context of Europe, national politics in the present is rarely determined by a nationally bounded past. So at no time since its inception as a polity was Britain ever simply a nation state. While there may have been a national project at the heart of the imperial state, that state had been supported financially and otherwise through the labor, resources and taxes of its imperial subjects as much as its domestic ones. I'm just going to make an aside here and partly because many people have very little knowledge of this fact, and this is that colonial subjects in India paid income tax, which went into the coffers of Westminster at a time when the working class in Britain and the majority of the middle class paid no such tax. And indeed, it was the taxes and tribute from India and the rest of the empire, which enabled the British state to waive taxes from its working class and middle class populations, while at the same time using this imperial dividend in the provision of welfare to them. Colonial subjects, however, were excluded from any redistribution of that wealth, even during periods of catastrophic famine, as in India. And the case against famine relief was made in the fear that if arguments for, for such relief were accepted, then it would lead to arguments for the permanent maintenance of the Indian poor. This was at the same time as general poor relief was provided as a legal right to the destitute poor in Britain. So Britain is established economically through the extraction of taxes from colonial subjects and in the redistribution of its wealth as welfare, it establishes the idea of the nation. This long-standing asymmetry is at the heart of the dysfunctional politics that characterize our contemporary times. I'm happy to pick up on this and other aspects obviously during the discussion, but back now to the main body of the talk. So after the results of the referendum to leave the European Union were announced, there was some commentary that this reflected a nostalgia for a time when Britain was, in its own terms, unproblematically at the head of global geopolitical formations, namely empire and then Commonwealth. David Olusuga further suggested that the imperial nostalgia at the heart of Brexit was not even a recent phenomenon. Ever since the loss of the 13 colonies that became the United States of America, he argued, there had been a nostalgic yearning for lost colonies, and perhaps more importantly, the wealth and global influence that came with them. In part, what I would suggest that we are witnessing in the contested debates post-Brexit is a belated recognition of the loss of empire, as Britain reckons with what it means to become a small island. Andrea Levy's novel of the same name, Small Island, plays with the term, referring both to the island of Jamaica from which some of the main protagonists come, to their realization that Britain itself has become a small island after decolonization and the loss of empire. The Brexit years then have been defined by a narrowing of vision of who constitutes the body politic and who ought to be considered the legitimate object of public policy. In other words, who belonged, who really belonged, and who did not. Belonging to the history of the nation was presented as central to the possibility of being acknowledged as being a legitimate part of politics and a legitimate object of policy initiatives in the present. Such arguments, however, profoundly misunderstand the history of Britain, as I've been setting out. Further, as Anne Dummett argued, it was only with the revised British Nationality Act of 1981 that the meaning of British came primarily to signify a connection with the UK alone. Prior to that, in common parlance, in school history books and the law of nationality, British signified belonging to the British Empire rather than to the island of Britain. While this more expansive understanding, albeit within a system of hierarchy and domination, is absent from most discussions of what it is to be British 
It is an understanding that dramatically came to the fore during the initial period of the COVID-19 crisis. What was clearly demonstrated during this period and since was that Britain is a multicultural nation and perhaps more significantly, that it could not function effectively without its ethnic minority citizens and migrant populations, both settled and temporary. Indeed, it was precisely these populations that were disproportionately carrying the burden of maintaining the nation's health and lives under lockdown, and who were most at risk of the exacerbation of existing inequalities. Whether one looks at the NHS or at key workers staffing supermarkets and corner shops, delivering food and other necessities, operating public transport, cleaning workplaces, collecting rubbish, and over the summer being chartered in to pick fruit and vegetables. These workers were disproportionately migrants, both from the EU and further afield, and they were ethnic minority British citizens. If we were to rethink Brexit in the light of COVID, we might come to understand that alongside those represented as left behind, there are also many who have been left out. Left out, that is, from understandings of who we were. I wrote this paper a little while ago, and obviously in the context of the news over the last couple of days around educational achievement of particular communities and the way in which the government is seeking to pit white working class uh, children against children from ethnic minority backgrounds, we see that this wish to rethink Brexit in the light of COVID is very much a wish and not something that is actually happening in any sustained or systematic way. What I'll just go on to address now in conclusion then is precisely those who have been left out of our broader understandings of who we are within Britain uh, and actually within Europe as well and how and why it matters that we rethink the histories that have produced narrow parochial understandings in favor of more expansive ones. The decolonization of Europe would require Europe to take its colonial history seriously. And this would require a methodological reconfiguration as much as a substantive one. The problem, as I've implied earlier within this talk, rests in part in the prevalent notion of European states being nation states having empires. Instead of more appropriately understanding what we call nation states as being imperial states, that is empires. This is important because within much European scholarship, the question of the legitimacy of political rule is primarily discussed in terms of the nation. Since colonization and the establishment of imperial rule over others cannot be legitimated through such a discourse, it's usually evaded as a matter of relevant concern. In this way, scholars believe that it's possible to tell the histories of European states in national terms and to tell the histories of Europe in terms of the aggregation of these national histories. Yet these histories spilled over their retrospectively ascribed boundaries and not to acknowledge this is also to fail to acknowledge the violence and domination associated with that spillage. Europe is the wealthiest continent on the planet. Its wealth is an inheritance that derives from the very same historical processes that have left other places poor. Formal decolonization may have reduced the flow of wealth from elsewhere to Europe, but it has neither stopped it altogether nor has there been any reparation for the earlier histories of domination, oppression, or extraction. As such, decolonizing Europe requires both epistemological justice and material reparations. Epistemological justice involves recognition of the knowledge claims of others in terms both of respect and reconstructive response. And it emerges from the perspective of connected sociologies that I have elaborated elsewhere material reparations would require to be worked through collectively, all the while taking heed of M.A. Césaire's injunction that, and I quote, there are sins for which no one has the power to make amends and which can never be fully expiated. If we cannot fully expiate them, what could we nonetheless do? 
There is something truly puzzling about European scholars' failure to address colonialism as constitutive of their societies and as constitutive of every aspect of their possibilities of being. Perhaps the explanation for this omission rests in the fact that colonialism and enslavement led to the betterment of European societies directly at the expense of the lives, livelihoods and environments of others. And people don't wish to reckon with what the consequences of proper accounting would open up. What is needed, I suggest, is a reparatory social science committed to undoing the inadequacies baked into our disciplines and working towards a project of transformation and repair. What this would involve as a first step would be to rethink our disciplines by taking modern empire as the unit of analysis rather than the modern nation. Second, it would be to recognize that what we understand as the modern world is actually the colonial world. Third, taken together, these would enable us more adequately to contextualize events and processes that are often presented as separate and to understand them within a connected frame of reference, one committed to transformation and repair. A post-colonial reparatory social science provides us with the tools to adequately think through the issues and to come up with more effective solutions. It provides us with the tools for thinking anew about old problems and about new ones. Its purpose is not a scholastic one, that is, one that is simply oriented to the production of new knowledge. The new knowledge opens up possibilities of new and different actions. As such, a properly critical analysis, a decolonial project of and for Europe, would offer us the possibility of better understanding our shared past so that we could more appropriately construct a world in which all of us could live well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gominda. That was a lot. I was taking notes very furiously, and I'm sure that lots of people um, have uh, questions for you. Um, I just want to suggest to people to please put their questions in the Q&A box. And um, I think we have quite a bit of time. So I might just call on um, each person to um, maybe read out their question, if appropriate. Um, but um, this way, Gaminda also has um, access to the Q&A. But I thought, you know, I'll get us started. Um, I have so many questions running around in my head. Um, when you were speaking, I was thinking about um, uh, some work that I'm doing currently, where I had, uh, in a sentence, I had talked about the coloniality of power as being intrinsic to the EU's uh, foreign policy practice. And one of the comments that I got back was, you know, why have I chosen to use this particular lens? Um, and it was something that, you know, it's still something that I'm mulling over, although I think I have an answer now having listened to you, because of course, from my perspective, it is, as you say, baked in to what, um, to, to, to what is. So it's not a lens, so to speak, it's simply a description of what is. But I guess that then prompts a question that I think um, some of us who work perhaps with this tradition tend to get a lot, which is that the European Union itself uh, never colonized anyone. So how can we talk about the EU um, in, in the same ways that we might speak about the United Kingdom or um, France or, or Spain or Portugal? And I just wondered if you could say a bit about that. I mean, in, in response to that question, I guess I would really have to just draw on the work of Pio Hansen and Stefan Jonsson, who've set out within their book, Pure Africa, drawing on a range of scholarship to demonstrate the way in which, you know, it wasn't so, okay, let me put this another way. There are two ways in which I think we can understand the EU as constituting a form of colonialism. Firstly, the countries that made up the EEC, almost all of them, were colonial powers and had colonies at the time of union. And they brought their colonies into 
the European economic community. So France explicitly set out that Algeria was a part of France and that Algeria ought to be recognized as being part of the economic community. And Algerians had all the rights of others within that initial community except two. One was freedom of movement and the second was to be paid at the same rate as everybody else was being paid. And so even in its very instantiation, the European economic community institutionalized a racialized division at its heart whilst failing to acknowledge that it was incorporating colonial territories and colonial ideologies in its own construction. And then again, as Hansen and Jonsson set out, the European Union explicitly, or economic community as it was then, explicitly set out that it would be unable to exist if it was not able to draw on the land, labor, and resources of the African colonies that were being brought in to the European Union. And so remember, this is a time after the end of the Second World War, Europe is depleted in resources, in, in labor power, and so on. And its solution to how it addresses its devastation is to maintain the systems of devastation within its colonies in order to rebuild itself. And we see that in the way in which France, for example, maintains the, 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 the system of sort of um, linking the colonial, the currencies of, of its former African countries to the colonial franc system. Ndongo Sambasila has written about this recently and, and Fanny Pigot together, they've, they've co-authored a book and they've set it out quite explicitly. The ways in which money from the colonies was tied to European standards in order for this, what Utsa Patnaik and others have called a colonial drain in the context of India, but I think it's relevant to thinking about other things as well, to establish the ability of Europe to rebuild. And our failure to acknowledge those relationships as colonial relationships, which are at the heart of the European project and don't mark Europe as, or the European Union in any way distinct to the histories of European countries separately, but is actually a continuation of it. And it's a mythology that is being reproduced, including through the institutions of the EU, to present this idea as if the EU represents a break from the past rather than a reproduction of the past. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I'll start with the first one. And this is, um, from Andrea Peer uh, Vasquez, where she asks, um, based on something you said in your talk, where you know the emigres that were that went to different um, areas of the colony, um, and her question was, you know, were they um, supported by the state, or did they settle elsewhere on their own accord in order to be part of the colonial project? So there was a massive movement of Europeans across the 19th century. And that movement was facilitated by governments as well and by uh, migration associations that were set up. So, you know, an initial group of people would move, they would then set up a migration advisory sort of center and provide information for other people who wish to come and follow in their routes. So some countries provided financial aid to, for people to move, particularly those that they saw as poorer or, um, you know, Britain, for example, paid people or paid their way to go to Australia and elsewhere in order not to have to deal with issues of poverty at home. And so they exported their poor, if you want to put it in those terms. Other people went looking for a better life, looking for opportunities, looking for all the reasons, you know, they were economic migrants in today's language, except they didn't migrate. They were not migrants because migrants, when they go to another country, live according to the rules of the other country. When Europeans went to what we now call the Americas, they didn't live according to the rules of the indigenous people who inhabited that continent. They dispossessed them, they eliminated them, they took their land and they established their livelihoods on top of them. So these people should be seen as settler colonists who whether wittingly or not, participated in what comes to be consolidated as a European colonial project. 
And this is why when we think of European colonialism, it's not enough to think about it in terms of colonial projects executed by the state or heads of states, such as Britain and France and Leopold of Belgium and so on, but also it involved populations from across Europe, including people from Scandinavia, from Eastern Europe, and those parts of Europe which often think that, oh, well, we didn't have any colonies. Don't implicate us in this conversation. And it's like, well, if you actually look at the history of settler colonialism, you begin to see that most of Europe is actually implicated in the project of settler colonialism, which is what creates a European colonial project. Thanks so much for that. And I think actually what you've just mentioned does link into uh, the next question I'll ask uh, from um, Catherine, where, and, and it brings to mind as well, um, where countries um, like, say, Sweden, uh, Finland, for example, who've been very active in the sort of development field and really usually put themselves aside from actors like, uh, again, Great Britain uh, and France, um, behaving as if they're, again, uh, to use the term here, uncomplicated by uh, the history of colonialism. But actually, if you look within them, you sort of see uh, those practices of settler colonialism. But to use another example that Katrin uh, um, asks about here, she says, thank you for your talk. And she wondered if you could speak a bit more about Eastern European states, such as Poland, uh, where you give examples of having sent people uh, to settle abroad. But Poland itself was occupied or Hungary with its own history of um, being a province of the Habsburg Empire. Both situate themselves as implicated by Europe's imperial history and invoke national sovereignty to keep refugees and migrants out. What is their place in the sort of uh, imperial or post-imperial Europe? So I think we do need to have a complex analysis of these processes. I mean, places like Poland and Ireland in particular were both colonized by other European powers, as well as then contributing a significant population that goes out and participates in the projects of settler colonialism, particularly in the Americas, but also in South America, as, as well. And so in this sense, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind is both that these histories are complex and complicated and we need to approach them and think about the dual nature of some of these countries. So in the context, you know, I remember giving a talk a bit like this uh, or dealing with some of these themes in uh, Galway and one colleague came up to me afterwards and said, you know, oh, my parents would have loved half of your talk and hated the other half. So they would have liked the half where I talk about <laughs> Ireland as having been colonized by Britain and the consequences of that, but less sort of interested in or whatever in relation to the Irish going out to the Americas. And remember that many of the people from Ireland who migrate or leave, leave as a consequence of the famines that have been produced as a consequence of British colonial rule in Ireland. So these things are not about whether people were good people or not in the past, it's about recognizing what those histories are, how they've established particular sorts of structures and what that means for how we think about inequalities in the present. So the extent to which places that were themselves colonized and had their populations leave and settle elsewhere, for those countries to refuse refugees in the present is, hypocritical in the extreme and one of the reasons it happens is because people don't know their histories or they don't connect their own histories of movement out with the contemporary movement of people in and those sorts of things I think we need to address and one second point that I would make in terms of how do these countries now situate themselves in the context of the EU and, and so on well one of the things is is that even if there was a European territory that had absolutely no involvement in colonialism whatsoever, but it cho chooses to enter and join the EU, given that the EU has a history of colonialism, both through its individual member states, as well as itself as a collective project, then you choose to take the EU 
you know, I have this phrase, you can't take European enlightenment without European colonialism. If you wish to construct yourself as European and wish to be a part of the history of Europe in relation to issues of enlightenment, etc., you also then have to take on that that enlightenment was constituted in and through forms of colonialism and enslavement, that there's no two ways out of that. Uh, thanks, Gaminda. And actually, um, Christabel has a question here, which is also a, a roundabout way of having a similar question myself, um, where, especially with what's happening in the UK right now, and I think you sort of alluded to it during your talk. And Christabel's question was, you know, uh, could you could you speak about the commonplace reference to class in the UK without a reference to race? Whereas my question was, you know, how do we begin to even grapple with this when there's a refusal to acknowledge race, which is part and parcel of um, this sort of imperial history uh, and, and the sort of global racial hierarchies that you're speaking of? I mean, that's a massive, massive question. And it, so how, I mean, one of the issues is the methodological nationalism of our disciplines. This idea, as I was saying in the talk, that the unit of analysis that we work with is the nation state. That's something that's central to the social science disciplines. And yet European states were rarely nation states, or at least those states that are taken to be exemplary and, and uh, emblematic of how we think about disciplines are not nation states. And so the analyses that we develop that are internal to the nation, such as stratification in relation to income and wealth, which we call class, is something that occurs not in the context of the nation, but in the context of empire. So how do we, if we were to expand the boundaries of the unit of analysis from nation to empire, how would that force us to reflect on what it is that we're dealing with. So as I was sort of saying with the, the, the example on taxation, I mean, one of the things, and I only came to know of this sort of quite recently when I was working on, on a different paper, and that was that the working class and middle class in Britain did not pay income tax until around the time of the First World War. So in the context of contemporary debates that are going on around questions of legitimacy and entitlement and who has access to the welfare state and who seem to be, uh, you know, an immigrant who's come from the outside and it's unfair that they have access to this welfare which has been established on the basis of taxes that my ancestors have paid for generations and you've just come in and not contributed anything. It's like, hang on a minute. If we actually look at who's contributed to the resources that were available for the establishment of the welfare state, then we would have to recognize that it wasn't just national citizens, it was colonial subjects who gave of their labor and their wealth and, their, and paid through taxes that contributed to the wealth that comes to be uh, understood as national and redistributed only within national boundaries. And so class, is a national category. If we were to think about the British Empire instead of the British nation, which is the only reasonable category to work with because the British nation has no possibility of existing without the British Empire, then we would have to recognize that there were people whose labor was being exploited to a far greater degree outside of the nation and who got nothing in return from the state, it would have to cause us to rethink how we develop this categorization, what we do with it. And in part, I don't know whether it's just that the task seems too complex for people to engage with, or, and perhaps this is more the case, that they don't want to deal with what a reckoning with this would entail, which would be some degree of redistribution beyond the nation. So in that sense, class and race are both easy categories based on a misunderstanding of our past, which I don't think give us much 
analytical power in terms of understanding inequalities in the present. And I would say that about race as well, because one of the things that I distinguish is that the way in which race has come to be mobilized as a category within the social sciences is often associated with ideas of identity or inequality. I would want to think about race as something that's produced through colonial processes and is something that comes to justify the inequalities that are established on the basis of colonial histories. That's not so pithy as talking about race. And so I think that the focus on race and class both actually stops us from adequately analyzing the situation and intervening in it. I think, I mean, I think you might certainly have something there, this sort of um, how easy it's become to um, go to those categories. And we kind of, we definitely see it in the um, so-called backlash against uh, frameworks like um, critical race theory without a, a, a clear understanding of what it is. And yet we see in the United States laws being passed against um, a particular lens of studies, which, you know, is... Um, totally uh, antithetical to how even the most uh, conservative understanding of social science uh, might operate. Um, I'll go to, we have quite a few questions, which is lovely. Uh, our next question comes from Berna, who, um, you know, she acknowledges uh, your very illuminating talk and, and when you mentioned sort of the co-constitutive nature of uh, knowledge production about uh, Europe and the actual practices, both historical and present. And she asks a question that I think um, is uh, especially resonant now in the context of what's happened vis-a-vis -vis Germany and Namibia. And the question is, you know, what would be the role of formerly colonized regions in the sort of process of reparations? Um, and will this be a, a sort of collaborative project? So, and again, I mean, these questions are, are, are very tough in a way because they really, they require so much sort of contextualization to get at the heart of them. So one of the things in relation to say reparations, people who live in places that have been colonized don't necessarily know the histories or how to put it a different way. Like, we're in quite a privileged position when we've had time to read and think and to create analyses and so on of stuff, that that's something that some of us within societies do, not all of us, although there are people in all societies that are doing this. So I'm not sort of saying that this is something that happens in the North and not in the South. I'm saying that across the, the world within societies, there are some people who've done the work around thinking about the relationship between the histories of colonization and contemporary inequality. And many people who haven't had access to those histories and that, and, and are sort of living within those conditions. And in that sense, that people who have engaged with these histories, and it's usually people from formerly colonized places, and often those who've ended up in the global North for whatever reason, who come into the metropole with other knowledges and are confronted with what's colonialism? It's just in the past. It doesn't really matter. We've gone beyond that. We're now sort of, you know, in this whole other world and, and so on. You're like, but hang on a minute. These other places are still living the legacies of colonialism. And actually you here in the metropole are also living these legacies, except you don't recognize them because you benefited from them but you benefiting from them is also you living those legacies. So in that sense, to sort of point to those differences, it requires people who have understandings of other places and other histories to be able to bring them into conversation with dominant accounts in order to be able to make those arguments. So I think in many ways, it's because there are people from formerly colonized places who are in Britain, who can, say, hang on a minute, this idea that Britain established its wealth endogenously, well, what do you mean? Look at this history. 
just because you don't know this history doesn't mean that other people haven't known this history and actually have known it for a long time. So in the context of India, for example, Dada by Naroji wrote a book called Poverty and Un-British Rule in 1901 in English, published in England, that detailed the extent of colonial drain that was happening from India to Britain. The fact that that book is not read or understood as a British text or understood as part of British history is part of the way in which the colonial modes of knowledge production seek to reproduce particular narratives and exclude other ones. So in the same ways as any number of scholars from Walter Rodney to Samir Amin to Eric Williams to CLR James, you know, scholars have written this stuff. What would it be to systematize our disciplinary knowledge on the basis of their thought, as opposed to what is currently reproduced as standard. And so absolutely, there has to be that conversation. I hope that's clear. Ab absolutely. I think, um, I think it's something that certainly um, in my own sort of sub area, we continue to grapple with, you know, um, uh, even thinking through things like language, you know, who decided that, you know, in the context of EU-Africa relations, EU would come first when social science convention is well embedded into um, alpha, uh, you know, using the whatever first al alphabet comes first. Uh, and we know that this matters because of a deliberate uh, shift, even in the EU's own discourse um, around the, the changes it wanted to um, in institute uh, in the context of that relationship. Um, I'll, I, I just wondered if any of my co-panelists wanted to interject or had a question or comment at this point. We still have quite a few questions. So Richard or Jean. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gamina. That was absolutely superb. And, um, uh, and uh, I really, really look forward to, to reading the, the lecture, which obviously will be published in the journal uh, in due course. One of the things I, I wanted to pick up on uh, and, and ask you more about is, is the point you made about modern empire uh, as a unit of analysis. And I, and I wanted to, to press you a little bit to, to get a sense as, as to what that would mean sort of epistemologically and, and methodologically, particularly thinking about, you know, as, as you'll be well aware, you know, how mainstream sort of EU scholarship uh, unfolds uh, and uh, and whether well basically could you say more uh, if you don't mind yes I mean you know so this this question comes up for me a few uh, times when I've spoken around and I see that there is actually a question in the chat as well about would I go back as far as the Roman Empire or or you know and I recognize that there are also other empires such as the Ottoman Empire the Mughal Empire and, and so on and I think that within empires, that there is a distinction to be made between empires of domination and empires of extraction and conquest. And what differentiates between those types of empires is that empires of domination are usually the incorporation of territory that's contiguous to the core into a unified uh, territory where there may well be hierarchies and differences, but the populations within that empire are generally understood to be subject, you know, subject to the rule of empire and therefore included in imperial modes of governance. With empires of conquest and extraction, these are often empires at a distance. So you have the core in one place and the colonies elsewhere. And you have a process of extraction, whether that's of labor, laborers, or resources, or a combination of all three, where the wealth consequent to that extraction is reserved exclusively for the core and not for the colonies. So in the way that I was presenting in relation to Britain and India, that colonial subjects in India were taxed, that tax comes to Westminster, and Westminster uses it for its purposes within Britain, not within the British Empire. And so that aspect of a purely extractive relationship is something that for me distinguishes modern European empires from all other empires. 
Excellent. Um, Jean, do you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you first for this really illuminating lecture. I've been scribbling notes uh, furiously this whole time. Um, so I have a billion questions, but I'm just going to ask you briefly around uh, notions of citizenship and how they relate to this uh, decolonial project. I was really moved by your invocation to think of um, less in terms of nation states as our units of analysis, but more in terms of imperial states. And so then that brings, well, brings many questions, but one of them is sort of, you know, what do we do in thinking about citizenship um, as sort of not just the legal status, but also sort of notions of social citizenship or cultural citizenship. And so I'm just really curious to hear more your thoughts about how you see that fitting into the decolonial project that you've, that you've laid out. Thank you. Thanks for that. I mean, in the context of Britain, and Britain's the, the, the country whose history and, and politics I know best, when Britain established or legislated for citizenship, which it didn't do until 1948, so quite late in the process, it included everybody within the nation and within its colonies into the same category of citizenship. So it wasn't as if there were two categories that were similar. There was one category and that was that you would be a citizen of the UK and its colonies. And so in that sense, and that was, and then there was another category of citizenship, which was Commonwealth citizenship, which was available to everybody who lived in a country that had formerly been colonized by Britain. And that gave you exactly the same status as the citizenship of being in the UK and its colonies. And what that meant was that in 1948, Britain gave citizenship to something like 800 million people. And you might sort of wonder, and people often do, why on earth, given all the debates about migration, et cetera, in the present, why would Britain give citizenship to that number of people? Well, in part, it was because up until that time, the direction of migration had been from Europe from Britain to the rest of the world as a process of colonization. The movement back only occurs in the post Second World War period. And as it begins to happen and you begin to have what is called in the time colored migration, then suddenly you have debates within parliament in Britain about, oh my God, you know, I know we gave them citizenship but we didn't expect them to come and then there was a whole series of processes about, well, how do we stop them coming without removing citizenship? Because we can't remove citizenship because we still have colonies and it would be too difficult to do that. So what Britain does is that it establishes a new immigration legislation, which stops people being able to enter the country despite continuing to be citizens on the basis effectively of race. It's to do with colonial status and the difference between new Commonwealth countries and old Commonwealth countries, but it's effectively about race. And in fact, the Archbishop of Canterbury sort of chastises the government and says, why are you bringing these, uh, this legislation, this racialized legislation in? And the government responds and says, it's not about race, it's about geography, is the way it's way sort of out of this. So in that sense, what Britain has done, and this is one of the things that I think that we, mistake in our work on citizenship because we often think about citizenship as a way of including people into something is that if we look at the history of citizenship in Britain it's been about using the words of Raiko Karatani of turning citizens into immigrants so from 1948 to the Commonwealth Immigration Acts what those were about were about taking citizenship away from people from the from the former colonies of India Pakistan, Bangladesh, the, the other, you know, uh, Kenya, Uganda, etc. It sort of takes citizenship away. And then after Brexit, we're now in the process of taking citizenship away from non UK EU citizens. So all of these can be seen in a sort of particular trajectory, where citizenship has been turned into a parochial category from having been an expansive one, even if they didn't mean it to be expansive and equal, that was how it was established. And the history of it has been a narrowing. And so in that sense, I think we need to see Brexit in the context of the Commonwealth Immigration Act, because Brexit does nothing more than what was done to Commonwealth citizens in the 60s and 70s. I don't know if that quite answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought your last, Thank you. your, your last point was really interesting, given that, you know, some of the arguments that were used by um, Brexit supporters was, you know, 
um, by not making something like um, freedom of movement and being able to settle in, in the UK exclusive to European citizens, then it just becomes better for those of us who've come from outside um, of Europe, which of course, those of us who have come from outside of Europe, you know, um, at the best of times laughed very hard at the, the idea. At the worst of times, uh, you just sort of shook your head and, and now we're sort of seeing um, uh, how, how that manifests in practice. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions that are sort of related to backlash or potential backlash around this sort of decolonizing a project, both in a, in sort of uh, practical policy terms, but also in terms of the work that we do. And the first one comes from Tomas, who uh, says thank you and asks about, you know, when we proceed with this uh, decolonizing agenda, um, how do we make sure that the project is not perceived as a threat to the people who remain deeply attached to traditional Christianity, nation-focused history, uh, and today who view their hard-won uh, democracy as under attack, not only from within, but from outside non-European models such as Russia and China. So this, I mean, this has to do with, um, in a way, global ordering, so to speak. And then Akasemi asks, um, you know, how do you, um, and I guess here, um, asking for your experience, how do you understand the opportunities and challenges facing scholars, particularly scholars of color, who wish to conduct analysis um, situated within sort of race, uh, racialization, but within the decolonial project for Europe? And she asks this question because the common critique of research in Europe with decolonial aims um, that centers processes of racialization is that race does not matter for European politics? Okay, so again, two big questions. I mean, I think in relation to the first, in terms of what the decolonizing agenda is, I think it's, it's to misunderstand what is being argued if decolonization is understood as an attack on people. What decolonization is about is about a recognition that Europe's past has been a colonial past. It may claim it to have been constituted by nations and through national histories. But the more we do rigorous research and, and engage with uh, our past, we understand the colonial context for the majority of states within Europe. And then it becomes about how do we account for this colonial history in terms of the ways in which it shaped our present. And in that sense, I would suggest that, that there is a fear of a sort of um, attack on democracy and an attack on sort of ideas of democratic citizenship. And most worryingly, this is an attack that's being carried out in Britain by our government, because to the extent that the government explicitly says that you must follow a particular line about what our history is, and you must not investigate that history. You must not examine the multifaceted and complex nature of that history is deeply worrying. And we can see this with Oliver Dowden, who's the culture minister, making an argument recently that all trustees of museums and heritage bodies have to agree before they can become trustees, have to agree with the government's interpretation of what our history is. This is a deeply worrying attack on the democracy and independence of our civil institutions and our you know, civil society. And so in that sense, I would suggest that in Britain and possibly also in Europe, I don't know enough about what's happening in other European countries at the moment, that there is that there are two sides to the debate. On one side, you've got people committed to what I call democratic citizenship and accountability. People who understanding themselves as democratic citizens are interested in knowing how the past has configured their present and to think about how we need to account for that past within the way in which we construct politics in the present. On the other side, you've got people committed to opinion and authoritarian populism. 
And this is a very dangerous moment. And we do have to decide, what are we going to commit to? Are we going to commit to democratic citizenship and accountability? Or are we gonna go along with authoritarian populism? Because there isn't a bridge between the two. And we've seen how things don't really play out well if we fall on the side of populism rather than democracy. So in that sense, I would sort of say that there's a need to understand this as an inclusive project, as a project that would work for us all. And perhaps the question to ask those who are opposed to it is what they've got against a world that works for all of us. And then, sorry, the second question was, uh, no, I think it was just the, the second question was around sort of the, the processes of knowledge production, you know, what, and I guess maybe also speaking to your own experience, which is, you know, how, how do you respond to people who say, you know, race doesn't have any place in the study of European politics, which I think <laughs> you've made a very good case about why that's clearly not the case. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, again, there, I would sort of go back to this thing that I think scientific racism is something that comes to be established within Europe as a way of justifying its colonial endeavors. And so, you know, I, the way in which I think about this, which isn't necessarily the way in which many scholars of race or racialization would probably think about it, is that I would see that it's colonialism that creates or that provides the conditions for the establishment then of scientific racism as a legitimation of the colonial process. And so in that sense, race is directly linked to colonialism and is not something that can be understood as separate from colonial processes. And to the extent that European countries and European populations have been invested in the production and reproduction of colonialism, then they've been invested in the production and reproduction of a justification of racialized difference in order to justify the material inequalities that come to be established on the basis of that as well. I think that's a really um, good point because, I mean, obviously on the one hand, I, with Richard and uh, for other colleagues, we are sort of the editorial board of the journal, but we're also sort of aware of our responsibilities um, to the sort of field and to the discipline um, that, you know, regardless of whether we want to or not, we are perceived and in, in a way we're, we're in this position to sort of shape knowledge. And I guess, you know, from the sort of engagements that we have and conversations we have around knowledge production, we know that, you know, there isn't necessarily that openness to actually even have the discussion about sort of that process of um, uh, the impact of colonialism, uh, decolonial thinking, um, uh, because, you know, you know, and we've been told, you know, outright that, you know, this isn't something that is uh, pertinent to the sort of thing that JCMS should be doing. Um, but I guess that's a story for another day. So uh, excellent question and I think response as well. Um, so I'm well aware that we don't have that much time left, but I do want to get through. We have about six questions left. Um, and I think some of them you can answer really quickly. So um, next is from um, Rosemary, who asks, um, you know, in the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, did all signatories not commit themselves to meddle, uh, to not meddle in other countries and not to incite violence anywhere outside their borders? Did this commitment to pacifism exclude colonized regions? Um, I think <laughs> that's an easy answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it was basically that they agreed not to interfere in the affairs of other European nations. And what European nations did elsewhere in the world was deemed to be fine because people elsewhere in the world were not regarded to be people who constituted states and had sovereignty. Even if they did in their own terms, they were not recognized by Europeans as sovereign entities and so could be invaded. But then mm. that gets slipped out when talking about the need to generalize the principles of the Treaty of Westphalia in the post Second World War period. And it's like, well, you can't actually create a system of nation states on a 
on the basis of a principle that had legitimated the colonization of others without radically rethinking the principles that enable that to happen without contestation internally, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely. I think it reminds me of a sort of um, excellent talk that I heard from Sumi Madok around sort of the construction of human rights as well, where, you know, this, this is a term that, you know, certainly the EU stands and we talk about it, and, and, and we take it back to the United Nations, keeping in mind, of course, that there was a, 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 a huge part of the world where its peoples were not considered uh, human um, in, in the way that um, sort of those ideas filtered, um, filtered through. So the next question, I'm, I'm actually it's comments and questions, I'm going to read it out, is from Adrian. Um, and Adrian says, um, given the failure of idealistic transnational migration development ideas of the 90s and uh, noughties to escape domination extraction effect, and despite progressive arguments uh, about the effects of remittances, etc., and the subsequent gloomy return to world system type accounts and ongoing colonialism, um, can and how might ongoing migration from the global south be viewed as part of a transformative slash reparative dynamic of, for example, Europe, in line with uh, an argument that um, that is made by Achume migration as decolonization, uh, which I think um, is also noted by um, Lucy Mablin, uh, uh uh, book, which I believe you wrote the foreword for. Yeah, I mean, I think Tendai Achume's uh, article is brilliant, and I think it makes a very powerful case. My response to her argument, and we've discussed this as well, is that I think to think of migration as a form of decolonization, and to think that migration from the global south to the global north is in its own terms reparative, is problematic because it then takes attention away from the inequalities that have led people to need to migrate. So what, we do, what we're doing by focusing on migration is only enabling possibilities for those who have the capacity and the ability to migrate and doing little for those who remain in the conditions of poverty, inequality, and you know, the, whatever the conditions are that have led others to migrate. So I would want us to think much more deeply about our responsibility to those who remain in other places and remain in conditions of poverty, especially where those conditions have been created through the same historical processes that have created our wealth. I don't see migration as a solution to that. And I don't advocate for open borders as a consequence. I advocate for an address of global inequality. Right, okay, so another uh, question to be read, uh, this time from Drew, who says, um, when redistribution even within nations seems increasingly nearly impossible for center-left parties to do in the face of neoliberalism, or is increasingly um, directly uh, tied to ethno-nationalism, what political ways forward do you see for the practical politics of reparations beyond the nation? What else is there? I mean, if we accept the historical accounts that I've given, if we accept this, then what else is there for us to argue for, even if it doesn't seem possible? And I sort of would go back to this idea that you know, all social movements, all events which have transformed things, they never occurred just in the moment. There was a long history of people making the argument and laying the groundwork for the possibility for things to change at a time beyond our lifetimes. So I'm not making this argument because I think that this is something that in any way would be possible tomorrow, next year or the next decade. But I can't, mm. given what I know through the work that I've done, there is no other argument that I feel I can make except this argument. And it's something mm. that I'm prepared to listen to other points of view and be persuaded that there are alternatives, but so far nobody's provided me 
with something that I would see as an alternative to this, as a way of resolving the issues. And if we think about climate change, for example, I mean, if anything is going to get us to act, it might be the fact that catastrophic climate change is going to destroy our world within, within the foreseeable future. And so how do we shape that conversation in the context of the conversations that we've been having here today as well? And one way might be to think of the fact that whilst we here might be facing catastrophic climate change, this isn't the first time that people's worlds have been destroyed through the actions of others. You only need to be aware of indigenous peoples and their struggles to know that our world has been built on the destruction of their worlds. And so now we're asking for change in the context of the protection of our world. Well, if we want that to happen, we have to recognize how our world has been based on the destruction of the worlds of others. And how do we hold both of those conversations within the same frame. And I don't know what more than we can do than make these arguments and seek to persuade people that we need to do more and do it differently. Indeed. And just a final question from Jeff Kopstein, who says, um, how does the historical experience of the Europe of European Jewry fit into the broader historical discussions of empire? I mean, I think there I would go to the work of people like Emma Cesare and others who very explicitly tied the experiences of what happened to people within Europe in the mid 20th century with the longer histories of European colonialism, that I don't think that there's a, um, a, a divide between those, but that we need to understand these processes within a common frame in order to be able to understand how these are connected, how it was possible, and what it is that we need to do within, you know, to, to go beyond where we've currently been. No, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that. And uh, several thank yous uh, in the Q&A for bringing in the sort of climate change dimension. I guess, you know, we are close to uh, finishing up and I wanted to ask one final question, perhaps to sort of bring you back home, um, if, if you will. So one of the things that, you know, we're grappling with now, uh, I guess we're all grappling with it, is this idea of um, global Britain that is obviously juxtaposed against the sort of um, the EU as a global actor. And, you know, I guess if you're um, undertaking a decolonial analysis, you might sort of think, well, perhaps it's the uh, different sides of the same coin. But I did want to focus on global uh, Britain specifically because um, of what's happened recently in the UK. And what that might sort of tell us about, you know, the the, the possibilities again of, of of reparation or sort of thinking seriously about those histories. Um, as you know, um, the government uh, chose to uh, decrease the UK's um, 0.7 uh, commitment uh, to international development to 0.5, and part of doing that is that was actually to also take back money that was already committed. Um, to a project in the what we would call the global south and I, I highlight this because a lot of the money that was being pulled back was specifically around knowledge production and around knowledge uh, collaboration and i just wondered in if in your opinion what do you think that um tells us about the uh short to midterm um uk post-brexit um decolonial perspectives well, I guess I go back to what I said earlier, that what we're facing is a clear distinction between people committed to democratic citizenship and people committed to authoritarian populism. You can only make an arbitrary decision like that, which actually goes against the very rules by which the British Parliament is supposed to be run. If you're going to, if you don't care that this is an undemocratic decision and it's actually against the sovereignty of the Parliament, that you claim to have left the European Union to reclaim. So in that sense, it's a, a decision that gets made in a very problematic way. And it's also, if we were to think about it in other terms, the problem with the language of aid and development, because aid and development is about the benevolence of us to them. Reparations 
would be a, relation, a relational uh, understanding which recognizes our responsibility and accountability to others, not something that we're doing for others, but our accountability to them where they can make demands of us. And by not allowing development and aid to be understood as reparations, it reproduces an understanding that somehow we're beyond accountability. And that I think is, again, deeply, deeply problematic and dangerous and worrying for those of us who continue to believe that we live in a democracy. I think we need to see the signs of what's happening. I think we need to think about them more and then mobilize and act in relation to that thinking. Thank you so much for that, Gaminda. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are still thinking about different things, but I've certainly learned a lot. Um, it's, it's very clear that the, you know, there's still a lot of work um, ahead of us, but not only that, that, you know, we have responsibilities as well. Those of us who are um, in the academy working on this research, it's not just about, you know, critiquing uh, policies as uh, individual um, citizens or, or, or what, what have you, but actually that, you know, we have a responsibility through our scholarship to really think about um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these issues because we're certainly not there yet. And uh, I think, as you said very clearly, we don't have a choice, you know, we don't have a choice if we, if we truly care. Um, I would like to say thank you to Jean for uh, stepping in um, uh, to lead us uh, in the session on behalf of CES and of course to CES um, for hosting. Uh, it, I, it would not be appropriate for me to end this without saying thank you to Adrian Favel, especially for helping us um, organize uh, this session. Very grateful. Uh, I should also note that Adrian is, of course, also a member of our advisory board. So thanks for that. And of course, for my partner in crime, always Richard, uh, for um, basically basically letting me do whatever it is that I I wanted to do. So thank you for always being so supportive, and to our wonderful audience. And um, those questions were so insightful. Um, yes, I, I think everyone deserves a a, a clap there for so, or sticking with us and asking such important questions. I think like, like Jean. I just just yeah. to say, you know I really like thank you to you both for the invitation but also the questions from the audience were just really fantastic and really enable that productive sort of conversation to happen so thank you so much absolutely um so I just want to encourage other people to keep going to sessions very exciting conference we have here um, um and it, it's hard to pick really but certainly um, uh, check out the program if you haven't yet. And hopefully I'll see you on one of the other panels. Thank you so much.